Welcome, everyone. Episode 111 of the Talking Fires podcast. Ben Fadden, your host today on a day where Major League Baseball seems like they're making progress with the players uh, on a big you know, CBA agreement. We are talking with a minor leaguer in the Potters organization, Kevin Copps. He finished last year in double A with San Antonio. Kevin, thanks so much for joining. Thank you for having me. All right. So first, starting off, uh, you know, you went to Arkansas, won the Golden Spikes Award. What advantage do you think that Arkansas experience gave you, you know, heading into the draft, heading into your professional uh, baseball experience, you know, pitching in, you know, the biggest conference in the country? Um, I think there were a couple advantages that I had while I was uh, throwing there. Uh, first off, I think the way that Arkansas's program is run is very similar to like a pro style approach. It's kind of like they want you to figure it out on your own and ask questions when you need help versus I think a lot of coaching styles is like the coach is just telling you what to do. I think that kind of gave me a little bit of advantage um, as far as pro ball and um, on the skill side of it. Um, I think just learning to play and compete with like the top uh, players in the country constantly um, really helped me uh, advance in minor league baseball. It's, I don't think it's quite double A, but I think it's somewhere between high A and double A, the level of baseball. Yeah. Um, now, how did that, how early at Arkansas did the Padres show interest in you? Um, I actually don't think I ever had a meeting with the Padres um, as, uh, as far as scout meetings go. And I wasn't too sure. My, my agent kind of kept that kind of under wraps. He didn't really want me to worry about the draft or anything. So I didn't really have much of an idea. All I remember is right before the draft, I saw the Padres logo. And I always thought it was really cool, like the new color scheme where they went back to the old color scheme. So that's kind of the only thought I had before. Mm -hmm. um, now, with A.J. Preller, did, did you know, did he ever scout you in person? And how many times, did you have any relationship with any of the Padres scouting department at all? Um, again, I didn't really... I didn't really talk that much. I don't think I was super high before the season. So I think that was part of it. And during the season, uh, Arkansas doesn't really let um, scouts kind of talk to us. They wanted, wanted to leave us alone. But I did hear a funny story. Uh, I heard it was A.J. Preller was at the SEC tournament and I was facing Vanderbilt and I didn't throw a single fastball to Vanderbilt and our manager was sitting next to him um, charting pitches and velos and stuff. And he was just like, hey, text your coach and tell him to throw a fastball. I want to see a fastball. <laughs> so, but that was the only uh, real uh, time I ever heard about him watching me. That's an interesting story, yeah. Uh, <laughs> now, in, in that first season that you had last year with the organization, ERA under one, in that season, how much confidence, I guess, did your performance give you that you can – you know, keep building on that and maybe even help the team this year? Um, I think when I started pro ball, I kind of got a little bit out of my rhythm. So I was kind of fighting that throughout the way and trying to get back into rhythm. Um, I mean, I had a lot of confidence. I think it's more I expect. I have, a lot, I have high expectations for myself, so it's hard for me to get, like, satisfaction out of things that I should have. Um, so I think that just helps my drive to uh, keep moving up. And so, well, I guess that's kind of my next question. You were, so you pretty much had the confidence to like expect that you were going to pitch that well in that first year right out of the gate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I expect myself to do that every time now that I've done it, you know, it's just one of those, I just have really high standards for myself. And when I don't do it, it's, it's a bad week. Mm -hmm. Now, Looking on YouTube for anyone, you know, looking up as Arkansas highlights or whatever, I what I notice is the kind of a low leg kick. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? And is it a lot of legs, you know, driving off the mound? Is that because I, I just feel like a lot at the major league level there, you see some high leg kicks, but yours is kind of like an in-between. Yeah, I think I've kind of experimented around with a lot of things. I've I think the high leg kick, in my opinion, everybody's body's different, so it's hard to really say for everybody else. But to me, 
if I drive my leg up high, I load into, I get like a good pelvic load a lot better. But um, I try to simplify everything the way I sit in my legs when I come set. So I don't have to worry about like getting a high leg kick. And the, I think the more of the purpose of that is to be quicker to the plate um, to control the running game a lot more. Um, and just to simplify everything for me when I'm throwing. Mm -hmm. Have you, before the uh, lockout, did you have any uh, communication at all with Ruben Niebla? Uh, and if, if you have, how has that gone? Uh, yeah, I did. Um, uh, he was kind of around the complex for a little bit, but um, as a lockout kind of stalled a little bit, all the major league coaching staff kind of pulled out and, uh, so I haven't been able to talk to him recently or get to see him recently, but he's, he's awesome. He's really nice. Um, I don't really have a ton of questions all the time, but I like to sit and listen. And just by listening to him, talking to other guys, I've, I've gotten a lot of good uh, information for myself and what, like what I need to feel. And from like, from the experiences that you've had with him, you know, early on here, what is he kind of like? Is he like a big analytics guy? I know that most probably are now younger pitching coaches, or is he kind of just trying to simplify simplify the analytics and bridging that gap from that to communicating with you guys and trying to make it as simple as possible? Uh, I think it's more of a, a uh, I haven't really talked to analytics with him. I think, but I think more of the coaching style is trying to bridge that gap between like mechanics and analytics. I think people can overanalyze. I'm, I'm guilty of it too. Overanalyze analytics too much. Um, and I, I think that's just part of because everybody's body moves differently. Um, but yeah, I, I think he's a good solid in between. Mm. Now I read on Wikipedia, tell me, you know, if I'm right or wrong, that you change your pitching delivery based on how it felt you know, playing fetch with your dog. Um, what more can you tell us about that? Uh, obviously, it feels like that delivery now is more natural to you. Yeah, so I had uh, Tommy John in the fall of 18, in the fall of 17. And after that, I decided to try to mess with my mechanics, try to, I would say, shorten my arm action like you see some big leaguers do. And before then, I didn't really know that it, your body style matters and how your hips are aligned and everything like that matters. So I tried a different um, arm action and it worked. It did not work at all for me. And I, I had a really rough COVID, like that shortened COVID year, really rough time all around in scrimmages and games. And uh, I just was just stuck thinking because everybody was in lockdown for COVID and I was playing fetch with my dog and I just thought I'd try my high school arm action while I was playing catch with my dog and it just felt natural and easy. And I, and that's what it is when you get like, I think that's what major leaguers do. They don't think about anything when they're pitching. It's just their natural motion. So um, yeah, I found it just playing catch with my dog. And on top of that, I actually bought a tennis ball <laughs> to throw against the wall here just to kind of keep that feel going. Uh, you talk about kind of that shorter delivery, not really working for you. Uh, I've seen, obviously, like Lucas Giolito, you know, use that. Other guys in the big leagues. Was that short arm delivery, was it like location, just control? What kind of not worked there? Um, um, movement, pitch movement. Um, I was going for – and on, I was looking too much into analytics, and I was going for harder pitches. I was going for um, carry on my fastball. And it just made all it. I, did, I got less depth and movement out of my off speed. My fastball was just, it didn't carry as much. I just, it made everything analytically worse um, for me. Okay. Uh, now, the athletic came out with an article this month, you know, saying that Major League Baseball doesn't want to pay its minor leaguers during spring training. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Obviously, I had a podcast episode where. I was really frustrated with that, um, especially that's like your guys' is probably biggest time of the year trying to impress big league clubs. Um, what do you think of, you know, that pro, you know, that whole situation? Um, obviously, this is my first spring training, so I didn't even know that they didn't get paid. Okay. Um, I think it's kind of, I don't know what the right word is. It, it does kind of suck 
that minor leaguers don't get paid during the month, the extra month that they're here. I'm not really sure. They don't really get paid that much, so I'm not really sure why that is, and I can't really speak for I feel like I can't speak for the teams or like the manager or the owners of why that is, because I don't know. No one really knows any money situations. Right. Yeah. There. Yeah. The explanation, I guess, that the league said that you guys are like trainees during that time instead of employees uh, like you are during the season. Um, but then even I like brought up the argument that, well, I used to work for the Padres as a ticket seller. And during my trainees, my training time, I still got paid. So it was, it was just kind of weird. Um, but like, so the, I don't know if you know about the website advocates for minor leaguers.com. They said that double A players make $600 per week during the season. Um, I'm not, it's not a question about the pay, but just what about what's like the living conditions and the food for you guys that you experienced in the minors? Um, kind of speaking on that and on like not in not getting paid in spring training. I think what has really helped is that they're going to pay for a living now. So we get a little bit of that money back um, per paycheck, which is like, which is kind of huge for the little amount that we get paid. Um, But the living, (laughs) the living was all right. I, when I was in San Antonio, I was in a hotel the whole time because I had just moved there and I wasn't going to be there very long. So that was nice. Um, But in high A, I think I shared a three-person apartment with seven people and that was I mean it was fine (laughs) it was cheaper I I I wasn't I I didn't I didn't have a big problem with it um I had heard a lot more horror stories about living and food and stuff but I think it's gotten a lot better like the food wasn't bad I didn't really have any complaints to be honest yeah okay yeah because that's interesting because I've you know heard stories about guys having like one-room apartments and sleeping bags and four guys in one you know apartment and all that and yeah so that I was just curious from a minor leagues minor leaguers standpoint if those you know things were actually you know true yeah well actually I mean my my situation wasn't that bad but one of my teammates had his bed was where the uh, dining room table should have been which I thought was really odd <laughs> they oh, just threw yeah. a bunch of extra beds in there yeah uh uh how do you think change can be like made to better conditions? I know you talked about paying for housing and that's a, you know, that's a really big start, but is it just as simple as an increase in pay? Um, yeah, I mean, housing is a really good start. Um, I think the, the hardest thing, the, the, the worst thing for me is food. I'm really picky about food and not like I'm a picky eater. I'm really particular in like healthy foods and healthy foods can be expensive. So I think having some sort of service like that, some sort of a better food service or maybe a little bit more meal money, especially since guys, uh, most of the time guys don't have their cars. So they have to door dash a lot, which gets really expensive really fast. I think I think food would be the biggest um, plus um, to the addition to that. Okay. All right. Now let's move to a little more fun topic, you know, with current Padre major league players, obviously Tatis and Manny and everyone. Um, Who are some Padres pitchers though, that you've been in contact with and kind of tried to, you know, soak up as much info as you can from them. I really haven't seen very many big league pitchers. Um, since I've been here, I actually haven't seen any, I haven't been able to talk to any with the lockout. Um, I've been in Arizona, uh, pretty much the whole off season and the big leaguers haven't been able to <laughs> be at the complex cause the lockout, but, um, no, we have, we have a lot of great coaches, uh, that have spent a lot of time in baseball that I've been uh, getting a lot of good info from. So who, uh, okay. So who would then once hopefully spring training, you know, does get started and all that, who would be that, you know, first pitcher that you'd want to talk with? Probably you, you Darvish. Okay. Just because of his, uh, his arsenal and his ability to feel pitches. Like he has so many pitches and that's, that's such a skill. I think that people don't understand is the ability to feel that many pitches and be that uh, crisp with that many pitches. Um, cause the amount of maintenance, I don't think people understand the amount of maintenance each pitch 
has to like undertake. Mm. Uh, so I would I would like to pick his brain about um, how he keeps all of his pitches sharp like that. And I also heard that he throws bullpens left handed. So I'd like to <laughs> yeah, like to hear I, more about that. I think I've heard that once, but yeah, that um, what I do know is what he has like 12 pitches, something really, really weird like that. Like something I've never heard before. How many pitches do you have? Uh, uh, I guess technically five. Okay. If you, I have a uh, one seam sinker, cutter, curveball, changeup. And your favorite pitch is my cutter. Okay. <laughs> By yeah. four. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So just imagine you having double that pitches, and then the communication, right, with the catcher, with Caratini in Darvish's case, that just seems like it would take a long time, you know, getting that process down with the catcher. And then you, like you mentioned, guy, I'm sure during bullpens and all that, you don't want to, you know, be out there for two hours. So you don't want to overwork yourself. So I would think it's a lot of just what pitch, I guess, visualization and, you know, just messing with different grips, right? Yeah, exactly. I didn't even think about the relationship with the catcher. You have to really get to know your you're, if you're a catcher, you really got to get to know your pitcher if he has that many pitches to make the game calling smoother and to be on the same page. And then, like, yeah, in a bullpen, you only have a select number of pitches you can throw, so each pitch gets less attention. So that just kind of adds to the craziness of the amount of pitches he throws. Right, yeah. Uh, what? If, okay, last question here. What's your expectation? Are you, are you kind of just going into it and hoping – that you can crack the big league roster this year at some point? Is that your goal or what are you expecting for this year? Uh, my goal is to make an impact on the big league roster. I don't want to just be like a guy that kind of comes up and just a normal reliever. Um, I, I really uh, would like to make an impact and kind of get myself settled in. I mean, yeah. that's my goal. Yeah. All right. This has been fun. Episode 111 of the Talking Cars podcast. Kevin Cops. Again, I'm Ben Fadden. Kevin, thanks so much for doing this. Thank you. Thank you, Ben.